Stefan Jakiv, who plays the violin in the Korean Chamber Ensemble Ditto, is praised as a young prodigy. But to the Korean fans, he's better known as the grandson of famous writer Pi chun -dil. In September, Ditto will be presenting their unique performance that combines music and art to the Korean audience. On today's Heart to Heart, we have invited Stefan Jakif to tell us more about his music. Hello, welcome to Heart to Heart. I'm your host, Lee Soo Jung. Today, we're joined in the studio by a world-famous violinist. So let's meet Mr. Stefan Jakiv. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me on the show. I know you're busy. You're about to have your concert pretty soon. Right. How busy are your schedules these days? Well, actually, um, I just came from a long tour of Asia mm -hmm. with an, a group called the Asian Youth Orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, it was one month long mm -hmm. and a lot of traveling. Um, started in Hong Kong then went to mainland China, um, went to Thailand, um, Taipei, um, Hanoi, Vietnam, mm. Malaysia, mm. and ended in Tokyo. So I arrived from Tokyo a couple mm. days ago. And now I have a couple days off in Seoul, which is mm. nice rest. Mm -hmm. And then concerts in Seoul in Korea start uh, day after tomorrow. Mm. How are you preparing yourself for the concert? How, uh, what time do you get up in the morning? And when, what time do you start practicing? Well, um, I usually wake up around 8 or 9. Mm -hmm. um, and Which is fairly an early hour for musicians. Pretty early, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I pretty much practice as much as I need to, which varies from day to day, mm -hmm. um, depending on what I need to prepare um, or how ready I am. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have a set schedule of a certain number of hours that I have to practice every day. I do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And this concert you're about to present, uh, is it your solo concert or is it something to do with Ditto? Well, this, um, this tour in September is with Ensemble Ditto. Mm -hmm. um, so there are four of us, and um, we're playing together on this mm -hmm. tour. Okay. I want to know more about this Ensemble Ditto. Am I pronouncing it right, or is it supposed to be pronounced Ditto or Ditto? Um, well, I say Ditto, uh -huh. um, but I think in Korean, um, in Korea, people say Ditto. Okay. Um, and it's a group of four musicians, um, and it was started by the violist Richard Yongja O'Neill mm -hmm. in 2007, mm -hmm. and I joined in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, so this is my fourth summer with them. And um, Richard's dream was to um, make classical chamber music very popular mm. in Korea, mm. and um, especially among young people. Mm -hmm. And I think he's really succeeded in doing that through mm. Ditto. Um, we play core classical music repertoire, so not crossover music, mm -hmm. but serious classical music. Mm -hmm. But we're presented in a way that I think is interesting and attractive to young people. Mm -hmm. So it sort of breaks down some of those barriers that people sometimes feel towards mm -hmm. classical music and makes it a little less formal mm -hmm. and more welcoming. Mm -hmm. What does Ditto mean? Well. Um, I think in several languages the word ditto means likewise. You mm -hmm. know, if someone says something and you think the right, same right. thing, you say ditto. From that movie Ghost. Is that from Ghost? It? I yeah. didn't know that that's yeah, where yeah. it originated from. Yeah. Um, and I think it, from what I understand in Korean, um, not only does it mean that, but also it has a more sort of almost emotional weight to it. It means, mm. you know, I feel likewise. Ah, There's a sort of a connection. I see. Um, and in music, I think. You know, especially in chamber music, that's what it's all about. It's musicians coming together and feeling alike and feeling something together. Mm. And hopefully the audience feels that too. Mm. When you joined the ensemble in 2008, did you, did you sort of sense that the ensemble will be uh, this much loved? You know, actually, I knew very little about the ensemble when I joined. I met Richard in 2007 in Seattle in mm -hmm. the States. And um, he had just finished his first summer with Ditto, and mm -hmm. it had been a huge success, but I had not heard about it. Mm -hmm. But I loved working with Richard in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And when he asked me to join Ditto, I joined just because of him, because mm -hmm. I really enjoyed working with him and liked him as a friend. Mm -hmm. um, so when I arrived in 2008 and saw the sort of response that Ditto was, was receiving, 
it was it was pretty surprising mm. and it was exciting. And what you just told me about how Ditto Ditto started was a new information to me because yeah. I thought somehow Ditto was organized by a management rather than it was a musician's idea to put together. I think it was it was Richard's yeah. dream. I oh. mean, he he um, he plays a lot of chamber music at a very high level, you know, around the world. Um, and I think he felt that chamber music was not as popular as it could be in mm -hmm. Korea, mm -hmm. and so he wanted to do everything he could to to change that. Hmm. Okay, tell us more about the concert that you're about to present in two days. Then, well, um, we're starting a tour um, of Korea, um, and the theme for this year is French music. Mm -hmm. So um, there are sort of two main pieces on the program that anchor the program. The first is the Ravel Piano Trio mm -hmm. for violin, uh, cello, and piano. And um, that's really our masterpiece in that genre. It's mm. um, one of the greatest French chamber works ever written. Mm -hmm. um, and the second half of the program is the Foray C minor Piano Quartet, which oh. has all four of us. Um, and another very beautiful, very heartfelt mm -hmm. work. Um, and to open, Richard and I will be playing a duo by Mozart, mm -hmm. um, which is actually the piece that Richard and I first played together in Korea mm -hmm. four years ago. So returning to that sort of, for us, I think has an emotional significance because, mm. you know, we have come far since then in revisiting mm -hmm. the piece. I'm also going to be playing with Jiong, the pianist, a very beautiful short piece from an opera called um, Thais by mm. the composer Jules Massenet. Um, and it's called Meditation. And it's Visual one of Massenet. Massenet. Oh, wow. And it's um, one of the most famous short, beautiful slow pieces for mm -hmm. violin. I think a lot of the audience members will recognize it. Wow, I would love to uh, go and see it myself. You should. Yeah. It'll be great. When, where in Seoul is it going to be? Um, it's at the Seoul Art Center, Seoul Yesera Jongdong, mm -hmm. um, this Sunday uh, at 2 p.m. And we're all really excited about it. Uh, before we go on with our interview, uh, for our viewers, I actually put together this video clip of you performing, oh, so okay. let's take a look. This looks like uh, Yes, Rajan. Yep, this okay. is, yeah. More of a guest appearance, was it? Yeah. So not only you perform in Korea with Ensemble Ditto, you do your solo yes. works here as well. Now I'm supposed to talk, but I'm so uh, <laughs> involved in this watching the video. This is uh, with Ditto from last year. When you do ensemble pieces like this, uh, does it require more time to practice with the rest of the ensemble members? Um, well, when I'm soloing with an orchestra, we usually only get two rehearsals, so maybe two hours total. Hmm. Um, whereas in something like this, there's almost unlimited rehearsal time, really? so that's that's nice. Okay. I assume that it's kind of rare, but what if you have like disagreements among the members? That happens. Um, you know, we all have our own ideas mm -hmm. and our own preferences, and it's impossible that you have four people who are always going to agree all the time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Usually we try every idea, mm -hmm. and often one is the most convincing and mm -hmm. feels the most right. Mm. And when you do a chamber music like this, do you have to have a leader, or do you have someone to sort of conduct you guys, or how does it No, work? no leader. Um, the great thing about chamber music is that it's, it's equals, and mm. everyone's opinion and also mm. everyone's role in the music is equally important. Mm. And um, so there is no feeling of some people following a leader. It's, really? We're all in it together equally, which okay. is very important. Then who the kind of judges like, okay, we should take a breath here together or we should pause uh, here together? It's, who, it's every, kinda... everyone just speaks up when they, when they say something. Oh. It's very informal. Really? Um, it's 
quite unlike when an orchestra rehearses with a conductor, and the conductor very much leads the rehearsal and leads the interpretation. Hmm. This is, um, you know, four people throwing ideas back and forth, and sometimes arguing. Hopefully, often coming to an agreement. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's much more democratic. Hmm. I checked out. Uh, I, I was doing some research on you, and you've done more than just this ensemble ditto. Uh, you collaborated more with ensemble uh, members around the world. So this isn't your first time being part of an ensemble. That's true. Right. Um, I do a lot. I play a lot of chamber music. Uh -huh. um, as I mentioned, I, I met C uh, Richard in Seattle mm -hmm. in 2007 at another chamber music festival. And especially during the summers, I play a lot of chamber music aside from my solo work. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's incredibly fun because you spend a lot of time with friends who you enjoy working with, other musicians, um, and there's sort of an intimacy to the whole project that you often don't get when you're, well, you definitely don't get when you're working by yourself, hmm. but sometimes you don't get with an orchestra because you don't have as much time with them. Hmm. Let's go back to when it all started for you uh, with a violin. Mm -hmm. well, how old were you when you were first given a violin? I actually received a tiny violin um, on my fourth birthday. And fourth birthday. Fourth, fourth birthday, exactly. Huh. Um, and was that because somebody had grown out of it? Exactly. <laughs> um, some family friends gave it to me as sort of as a hand-me-down because their children had outgrown huh. it. And um, my parents are not musicians, right. but they love classical music. Mm -hmm. And um, they had they'd been taking me to a lot of classical music concerts mm -hmm. and listening to music together at home. Mm -hmm. And now that we had this tiny violin, they thought it might be nice to start me on violin lessons. Mm -hmm. So I started taking lessons at a local music school and just sort of kept at it. Really? Yeah. Because you studied something else in college. You studied psychology. Um, I, I studied, started as a psychology major and then switched to a music major uh -huh. in, in college. How did you know that this was going to be your life? Did you know at that early age well, or is it something you yeah, later... Yeah, I think, I remember when I was eight years old thinking that I love doing this and I love music and music has an effect on me. Mm -hmm like nothing else does. Mm. Um, so I, my dream was to be, it was to make music my life already mm. from eight years old, but I didn't sort of jump into music head first mm. until relatively late. I mean, music is one of those things where people can be very good at it very young and right. they can start performing mm. professionally at a right. very high level very young. And I was not one of those people. Really? Um, and how old were you when you decided to actually become a violinist? Well. Um, I was committed to it pretty early on, but I only really started playing concerts when I was maybe about 17, which is, hmm. you know, quite young to start doing something professionally, but really? in the scheme, in the, in the music world is huh. sort of on the later side. Because you debuted, uh, you made your European debut when you were only 14 years old, that was sort but of then a, you say that you yeah, sort of doing it that, wholehearted that, when you were 17. That debut was sort of a... Um, a a one-time thing. I really? had a great opportunity when I was 14 uh -huh. and it went really well but I wasn't really ready to leave school and begin performing. Really? Both sort of personally I didn't want to do that and also I don't think as a musician I was ready. I don't hmm. think I had studied enough. I don't think I knew enough repertoire. Hmm. Um, so you know I, I waited a few more years to start performing with some regularity and now I'm 26 looking back on that I'm very glad I did because mm. the idea of starting to perform at, at 14 seems sort of ludicrous right mm. now. So when you decided to actually become a violinist, who did you look up to as far as like musical career goes? Musical career? Um, who, who do, who, whose footsteps did you want to follow? Well, I think when I think about musicians whom I'd, I admire and you know, when I was growing up, who I wanted to be like, it wasn't really a matter of, oh, I want to have that sort of career, mm -hmm. or I want to have that sort of recognition. Mm -hmm. It was more, I want to be that sort of musician. Mm -hmm. And I think it was more that I admired values and creativity in people rather mm -hmm. than their career. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, sometimes you, when you look at a certain musician, you sort of want to be like them just because of their longevity or because their that's true their way of their ability to communicate well with the audience I think that yeah. that is very true the, especially the, this idea of communicating with an audience and a commitment to music and an investment in music mm. and I remember um, you know to this day someone I admire a lot but when I was 
growing up, I went to a lot of concerts by the cellist Yo-Yo Ma. Mm -hmm. And um, there's someone who is an incredible communicator through music. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I really f get from his performances, and I think is incredibly important for any performer, is one feels that the music comes first. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in any sort of performance, a lot of attention can go to the performer because right. that he or she yeah. is the person on stage um, doing something very difficult, hopefully very well. Uh -huh. And there's a danger that it becomes more about the performer than about what they're playing. Mm -hmm. And I think being a good musician, a good in in interpreter of music mm -hmm. and a good performer requires a great deal of confidence because you have to have the strength of mind to believe that what you're doing is worthwhile for several thousand people to hear. Mm. But also I think it requires a great deal of humility because you have to recognize also that you're not really the main event. The mm. music you're playing is mm. the main event and you're sort of a vessel through which this music will be mm. um, communicated. Mm. And when, you know, when, when I went to, when I attended Yo-Yo Ma's concerts, I always felt that he played every concert like his life was on the line. There was mm. such commitment and such involvement. There was never any sense of routine. Mm. And for a listener, that's incredibly engaging and exciting also. The mm. exciting parts feel very spontaneous. And um, the heartfelt moments mm. have such commitment behind them that it, it really makes for an amazing performance and makes you appreciate the piece in a way that you might not otherwise be able to with a less committed performance. Hmm. Do you prefer having a concert soloist or if you were to choose one uh, among the two, uh, rather do you want to be a record artist? Well, I think these days people do both. Hmm. Um, for me, performing in concert is the most rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. um, there's something about sort of the there's something live. Yeah, yeah. about, about yeah. any live performance, yeah. that sort of that energy and that spontaneity, that unpredictability um, that is very hard to reproduce in a recording studio. Then again, in a recording studio, you have many chances to get it right. Hmm. I mean, what right is, is debatable. Um, but also in a recording studio, there's that pressure that that recording will be there probably forever. Right. And... Um, you know, the way you play it at that moment is how you feel about the piece at that moment. But 15 years from now, when that recording is still available, mm -hmm. you might not feel about the piece the same way. So mm -hmm. there's something fleeting about a performance that makes it more exciting and I think makes it more honest because mm -hmm. it's an expression of how you feel at that moment. Mm -hmm. What I am asking now goes back to what you answered before. Uh, because you, you won your concerts, uh, your performance, to be more about the music rather than yourself? Right. This You might find this question a little bizarre, but I want to ask. Would you rather prefer uh, having your audience clo with their eyes closed and just focused on your music? Or would you rather just um, have them just look at you and pay attention to what you're doing? Well, I do think that um, performance, in addition to being a, a hearing experience, is also a watching experience. Mm -hmm. And I think the visual aspect of performing is also important. Um, you know, there's something about watching a performance that you don't get from sitting at home and listening, mm. even to a live performance over the radio. Um, in terms of what I prefer an audience to do, I, I don't really have a preference. For me, as an audience member, when I attend concerts, I enjoy watching in, in addition to mm -hmm. listening. But I think if a certain audience member can appreciate the music more fully or is more moved by closing their eyes and listening, so be it. Mm. I want to talk about your teachers. You've, uh, you've learned from so many different teachers, but there is one teacher in your family who taught you about life and art. Mm -hmm. And that's, I suppose that's your grandfather? Right, my mother's father, yeah. Yeah, a maternal grandfather. Right. Who is Mr.? Um, Pi Chun Duk, a yeah. writer essayist and poet hmm. um, and yeah he I used to spend a lot of time with him during the summers my parents would come to Korea um, and they would leave me at my grandfather's house in mm -hmm. the morning and I would spend all day with him sometimes this would go on for three months mm -hmm. at a time mm -hmm. and um, he f first of all loved classical music mm -hmm. um, 
he had tons of recordings, tons of videos, and we used. To, I remember we used to watch videos of Karajan conducting Beethoven symphonies, of Bernstein wow. conducting. I remember I w first heard the Beethoven Violin Concerto, which is possibly the greatest concerto written for the violin. I heard it on video at his home in Seoul. Um, and so he introduced me to a lot of great music and sort of opened my eyes to how much one can love music. I was very young at the time. I was mm -hmm. four. I started spending time with him when I was four or five mm -hmm. years old, so just starting the violin. And he was so passionate about music mm -hmm. and so moved by music that it sort of made me excited about music, too. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't just music. I mean, we, we, he would like show me books of prints of his favorite, wow. um, you know, artists. Um, we used to sort. We would play chess together. Um, he would tell me about poets whom he admired, especially Irish poets like Yeats. Mm. Um, and uh, it was a very sort of cultural, culturally enriching experience with my grandfather. Mm. Um, so I think maybe part of the reason I became a musician is because he turned me on to music. Hmm. And in one of the concerts that you had in 2006, uh, Pichunduk actually came to your concert and you dedicated uh, the encore piece to right. him. Right. Hmm. Um, so he knew, obviously, that I was a serious violinist, um, and sometimes he would hear me practicing in his apartment during the summers. But he had actually never heard me in a performance because I had not really performed in Korea mm -hmm. up until that point. And in 2006, I was invited to play with the Seoul Philharmonic, which mm -hmm. is my first time performing in Korea. And um, he came to the concert, and this was his first time seeing me perform. And I think it was sort of a touching moment for him because he saw that all that hard work that I'd put in resulted in, in, a, in, you know, in a professional performance. And so I dedicated this encore to him because I think part of the reason I became a violinist in the first place is because of him. Mm. And actually, that was the first time he saw me perform and the last time I saw him, because mm. he died the following year. Um, and I'm very glad that he um, got a chance to see me play. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, we're already running out of time. Okay. But I have, like, at least ten more questions to ask you. So okay. let me uh, ask these Twitter questions that we got from our viewers. Yeah. Uh, I find this question very interesting, uh, which is... Have you ever felt jealous of other members just because they have better looks or talent? Well, let's see. I wonder whether the person <laughs> who's asking that question is implying that the other members have better looks or talent. Well, in all seriousness, um, we're all horribly jealous of Jiong. Oh, the pianist. Yes, we hate him because he's, he's so... He's quite stylish, too. Me? Oh, no, no, no. No, no. he is quite oh, stylish, Oh, he is. Too. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's... He's of another level. Uh, okay, that kind of answers that question. Right. Then. Now, this is my last question then. What do you plan on doing uh, musically in the near future? What can your Korean audience expect to see at your concerts? Well, um, I'm, after this Dudo tour, I'm coming back in November to play um, another recital, my second recital in Soul Art Center. Right. Um, solo recital, and I'll also be playing um, in Pusan during that mm -hmm. tour. Um, and the program that I chose for my first recital was not was music I loved, but maybe not so adventurous. Mm -hmm. um, but now that this is my second recital, and hopefully people will trust me enough as a as a musician to come to the recital, even if they're not familiar with the music that I'm going to be playing. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think you have to worry about that. You have enough fans. Out well, here. hopefully yeah. we'll see. We'll see come November. <laughs> um, but I wanted to sort of introduce Korean audiences to music that might not be played that often here. Music that mm -hmm. I love. Mm -hmm. For example, one piece I'm playing is the Aaron Copland Violin Sonata, which is an American piece from the 20th century. Um, and I'm an American. You know, I live in the States, and this music is music that I love and really believe in and might not be played that often here. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to use this chance to sort of introduce the audience All right. to this piece. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time today with us. Thanks and for having best me. Best of luck to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can rewatch today's interview with Mr. Stefan Jakiv on our Adirang webpage. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.